Great, thank you. So that's a ringing endorsement of the report uh, from, from all of the speakers. Um, we've actually got a good period now for discussion. Let, let me, if I could just ask one question before we do that. H how would you deal with potential trade-offs in the scoring system? As in, you know, an institution you know, could be very transparent, it could be very inclusive, but deeply ineffective, and vice versa. You know, that you could argue that some of the outcomes from the London G20 summit, I mean, didn't happen because it was inclusive. It happened in a sense because it was non-inclusive. So I, d I just wondered, you know, in the, in the sort of the scoring system or the weighting system, how you would mm. approach that, that type of measurement question. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin. Sorry, <laughs> you don't have to answer that now. We can, <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can throw it open and you, you can no, I'll, it I'll, I'll give you an answer. Okay. I'll give you an answer. Yeah. Actually, uh, there is a, at least it's presented as a dilemma. You get more people involved, it's less effective. You really can't rule the world with the 172 people. Um, I'd like to know how many people are in the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. Um, I bet there are no more than 20, maybe only 16, because you, it's highly effective. So I would assume that for effectiveness, there are only about 16 people in the parliament. Um, there are 435 members of the House of Representatives, and now that's totally ineffective, but I don't think that's a number problem. Um, but it, that in a global context, what we're, we're dealing with attention, where I think th there's a reaction against the uh, General Assembly of the UN of one country, one vote, and here I am a heretic. I don't think there should be one country, one vote, because if you have Palau equal to China, that just doesn't make sense, common sense. So what should be the rule? My answer, I don't know. The uh, system of constituencies in the IMF and World Bank is actually a brilliant first step, where countries self-select who they will be with. And going forward, if the U.S. Congress ever approves the 2010 um, reforms of the IMF, all executive directors will be elected. And any, if you're South Korea and you vote for Russia, you are automatically in the Russian constituency. If you vote for, if you're Liberian, you vote for the United States, you're a member of the United States constituency. So that is quite a, an innovative form of governance. <coughs> But I also think it's a bit of a false dilemma, given how large parliaments can be, and sometimes they're even effective. Sometimes they are. Um, okay, uh, let me take that up last. I, I, I was going to ask you about what you said about the IMF constituency, but like two more important points. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're first, uh, I think there is a difference in kind between analyzing an institution and analyzing an area where you think there ought to be an institution. I think that the chapters on the IMF and the World Bank are quite successful because they are, they, you have what they are trying to do and you can analyze, are they trying to do it in the right way? You have a, their constitutions, you can analyze, is this right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the tax system and to some extent the FSB are meetings of officials whose which are, who are primarily government officials who happen to be meeting to discuss something. Now, I think there probably should be some international institutions in some of these areas, but there aren't. And I think that you do need to change your analysis to have much more on saying where you think the need for an international institution arises. I mean, in the tax chapter, there's very little on why we actually need an international tax regime. I think we do. And I think something on unitary taxation, something on taxation competition, there's all sorts of issues you could have. But this is something which doesn't really fit into your current framework. So I think you probably need two different frameworks. Uh, the second major issue I have with you is on the accountability, who one to whom one should be accountable. I don't think civil society belongs in there. I agree with you, civil societies and parliaments are different. Parliaments should be in there. Civil societies should not be in there except insofar as they for some reason or another, are not represented properly at the national level. But here, I'm sort of going back to the uh, statements that were made by South Africa in 1999 about Seattle. Don't criticize uh, our internal things. We'll deal with 
what we're doing internally, and then p South Africa will be responsible for it after that. I think that unless, uh, when you're dealing at the international level, civil society has no direct role. And I think you, unless you justify it, which you don't, you just put it in as an as assumption, you need to be careful. Uh, uh, the constituency was actually something I'd, I'd made a footnote about to ask you about, because you were very um, complimentary about the World Bank and the IMF constituency system, and you are just now. It's not clear to me that that would work in an area where you are making rules. I mean, it's been very heavily opposed at the WTO for that reason. I mean, the Congress and the Parliament of the UK work because there is a general consensus that these are legitimate organizations who can make laws for us. Maybe some questions about the Congress at the moment. Uh, but in principle, the, that consensus is there. There is no consensus in the WTO, or I would argue in the IMF or the World Bank, that these can make rules for us. They can make conditions for loans to us, which we can then take or not take. But that's quite different from making rules. So I think that the constituency system is something which can work under very precise <coughs> circumstances. I doubt if it would work for tax. I don't think it's ever going to work for trade. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do actually, Jeremy, is take two or three questions. Um, and then I, I may even share them out to just to distribute the pain a little bit as well. I owe you, Kevin. I owe you, Kevin. The money will not be handed out under the table. I will do it openly. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Griffiths Jones, uh, ODI, and ITB Columbia. Um, yeah, I really like the report. I think it has a lot of very good points. Um, I, I have really three points. One is on, on the issues. I think you set out the big issues well, but I would have added some um, along the lines, uh, for example, Cyrus has started and, and uh, others have started pointing to. Um, I would ask, for example, you, you don't actually emphasize financial stability as a precondition uh, or as a trade-off with growth enough. I know it's in the back of your mind, but you don't sort of bring it out. And more generally, I think um, you don't talk enough about the need for the functions that these institutions like the IMF or the FSB should have in relation to the magnitude of the challenges. Because since the crisis, there has been quite a lot of activity on financial regulation at the IMF facilities and so on. But the problem is that it's not enough in proportion to the needs, and even less in the sense of climate change, of course. Um, so um, I think it, thinking sort of forward-looking and flexibly, more dynamically, um, which is also what you know Kevin and Cyrus uh, were saying. I think I think is is would be more difficult, but I think would be particularly useful. For example, is the IMF big enough? You know, I think that's a very valid question. Oh, the Congress spoke. It's too big. I know, I know, I know. I mean, we agree on these things, but uh, it's just how much you you emphasize. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think the emphasis on 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 effectiveness should be should be perhaps stronger. Um, and the point I was just reading a paper by by Jose Antonio and Joe Stiglitz, and they talk about how much these institutions contribute to the coherence of the global system. And I think that maybe that as well. Uh, for example, the, the issue of macro coordination and how that should take account the voices of the poorest and the poorest countries. A, they don't do enough macro coordination, of course the big countries don't listen to them, but also they do, when they do it, they don't take account of the impact on the poorest countries. So that, if you were to monitor that, I think that is so central because you know whatever the US does in QE, either in too much expansion or too little, we always complain, but, but it's right, it has so much of a big effect than, than a little loan from the World Bank or something. So all these big macro issues, I think, should be there. Um, on, um, on the issue of uh, inclusiveness, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as Sheila. I mean, I think NGOs have a legitimate place but only one of many places. And, and you have to recognize that they're not elected. I mean, when you say parliaments are government, yes, I agree with that, but that's good because they are, they are elected. So mm -hmm. it's good to have parliaments. Mm -hmm. And I would also be broader, for example, on finance. I think financial regulatory bodies should have representatives of users of finance, SMEs, consumers, um, 
development agencies, industry in general, rather than being so dominated by finance itself. It's too important to be left to, to the financial sector. And the same, I think, with the IMF. Where is the voice of people, you know, ministries of economy, of, of uh, industry, and so on? So I think uh, how to broaden. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit involved in a thing called Finance Watch in, the in Brussels, uh, who lobby the European Parliament from a non-financial perspective. And they have all these stakeholders, cooperative banks and so on, um, um, consumers, uni unions, um, which I think is quite valuable. And so if you could think about that as well, not, not just NGOs. Um, and finally, and this is a little bit like, maybe a bit like idealistic, but um, we always think of finance and then we think how to regulate it. And, and I th that's the way we all think about it. But isn't there a kind of more direct challenge of how we make the financial sector directly accountable, more democratic? Of course, regulation is a very important weapon. But how can we make citizens uh, have some bigger control over finance? Shouldn't you be looking also directly at the private financial sector? Because, sorry, sure. uh, because you know, it, 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 it's it's easy to criticize the IMF because we we have some governance and it's not very good, uh, or it could be improved. But if you compare it with with the private financial <coughs> sector, that's terrible. It's awful. There is no accountability. And uh, how could we think of some mechanism of democratic accountability to parliaments? Or Actually, there was, there's so much in those first two contributions, so rather than go to the third question <laughs> right now, let, I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond to I that. I thought you were going to divvy it up first. Well, I, I am going to divvy it up a little bit, but I'm not going to let you off the hook. No, 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 I wouldn't want to um, be off the hook. You, you know, the, uh, so, I mean, do, do you want to, I mean, may, maybe start with a couple of those <coughs> issues okay, that, sure, that sure. Uh, were raised there, that, um, yeah. you know, in thinking about inclusiveness, you know, what about the users of, um, of the services? Um, you know, what about thinking more broadly about tracking financial actors outside of the multilateral system? Okay. Um, we have a page limit. We can go no more than a thousand pages, so we can't do everything. Um, what I would like to point out, one interesting thing on Stephanie's um, inclusiveness in the financial sector if you look at the structure of the Federal Reserve Boards, mm -hmm. they actually are inclusive mm -hmm. of trade unions, banks. I think there are <coughs> consumers at the, at the five regional Federal Reserves, not at the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve Board in Washington. Mm -hmm. So that's an experiment, and there's been a lot of feedback on that where the banks have too much voice in their own regulation and governance. But that's an interesting example of that. I'm not mm -hmm. saying we're going to do it. I mean, what I'm doing is I'm listening very c closely. And Sheila, I very much agree with you that CSO should not be at a, the deciding table. We are not elected by anybody. I think we are an expression of free speech. And we have a right to speak, and we have a right to demonstrate, and our government has a responsibility to listen. And I think that's fair. Um, we, some people think we should have a vote. I don't think so. Um, so we are the, the voice of free speech, and we are as loud as we can be and as shrill as we can be, anything to gain attention. Um, so that is, now whether we can take on all of these issues, I don't know. Um, going forward for the, the year going forward, if we're going to keep this on an annual report, we are looking very closely at how to do impact or effectiveness. Mm -hmm. That's our focus for the next, the next thing. Um, and for example, on the Financial Stability Board, we will probably look at the standard setting bodies that in the first version of the chart of the Financial Stability Board were under the government regulators. And in version two of that charter, Everybody has their own turf, and mm -hmm. God forbid that anybody give orders to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is a chronic weakness of most of these institutions is that you can come to a consensus in the FSB or in the OECD or wherever you are, but implementation is 100% dependent on the nation state. Mm -hmm. um, and that's problematic. Um, 
let me stop there because uh, I don't may, know may, what else may, to may think. Maybe, <laughs> could I ask John to respond to Sheila's other point, which I, I think sure. is a really important one. That um, you know, Because on the issue of tax, you, 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 you look at the three institutions, mm -hmm. you, wh one of which has become sort of very central in the whole discussion, which is the OECD. Right. Um, you know, we, which, I mean, Sheila's right. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of ad hoc response mm. to a problem, mm. Mm. but which has huge implications because the way that the OECD shares information mm. or deals with capacity building stuff has big implications for Africa, and which clearly are, you know, are not necessarily th thought through because of the institutional structure. But it'd be, I mean, maybe mm. you, if you'd like to respond to Sheila's point. Well, first of all, I agree that there is a, a great deal of ad hocism here, and that's not helpful. I mean, you, measured, you mentioned one particular issue, which is of great concern to us, which is tax competition. And we, what we're seeing at the moment is that as, as uh, BEPS moves forward, we're seeing a gradual process of increased competition. Um, tax wars are building, and, that's that, and there's no institutional response to that. The last time the OECD did attempt to address that, in 1998, they were forced into a very quick retreat. So you're absolutely right. And I think um, that, that's one of the strongest cases one can make for having a world tax authority or something of the, along those lines. Um, um, I, mean, I, 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 do, I do want to emphasize what the point that Joe Marie made is, is that I don't think any NGOs demand a place at the decision-making table what we can do is to try to um, amplify messages on behalf of the public, but uh, you're absolutely right about the, uh, the role of NGOs not being in, uh, on the decision-making side. But in this area, well, NGOs, I think, have played a very important part in trying to um, uh, frame an environment in which the OECD could move forward on tax issues. But there is a massive gap here, and that massive gap lies with what we are now calling tax wars, which will, un I think, undermine all of the OECD's progress around BEPS um, and potentially you know, uh, um, lead to the eventual abolition of the corporate income tax and taxes on capital, which you know, the, is, a, is a truly um, dreadful scenario to consider. Um, is there a case? for having a world tax authority, and if so, how, how might it <laughs> have constituency? Yeah, <laughs> well, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> What's the answer? What's I don't the have the answer to that. What? I mean, I think that um, Vito Tanzi has come to, oh, yeah. you know, he's made that the case mm -hmm. very well in the past. Many years ago, Frances Horner made the case uh, mm -hmm. in the late 90s. She was making an extremely elegant case, I had come to that conclusion. Personally, I've come to that conclusion as well. But how, uh, how such a th an, an organisation might be governed um, is, is is beyond me at the moment. I, I just think there needs to be much, much more discussion around this. We need to open up that discussion, and perhaps we, that's that could be one of the useful areas where okay, we progress. So that, that's one for next year. But I, I, d I do think the the point that she makes is a, is a really critical one, actually, because if you think back to the last G8. I mean, a lot of that agenda was driven ostensibly by a concern over tax evasion in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the subsequent discussion has really taken place with Africa in absentia for the, for right. the most part. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which is really Absolutely. Yeah. So there was one more question in the front row here, and then um, one over here. So, Adrian, you have to say who you are. That's you. Oh, okay. Uh, you did have your hand up before, I thought. Adrian Hewitt from ODI. Um, well, Jo Marie made a throwaway remark at the beginning, which I'd like to pick up, uh, because I think she meant it anyway. She said, if you're not in the room, you're not a player. I believe that remark was originally said by a man called Sheldon Adelson, um, who's, uh, Adelson? Who's, uh, who's bankrolling the Republicans to get a mm. Republican uh, president in next time. <laughs> and he really is a player because his, his billions come from, come from casinos. He started with the mm. uh, Sands, the Sands Casino in Las Vegas, and then there's the <laughs> Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, and the one that's making all his money is now in Macau. There's a mm -hmm. Sands in Macau. But the reason why he wants a Republican government in is because there's a threat that gambling will go online and really offshore, not just offshore to Macau and so on. And so his billions are, are lost. Now, I'm just wondering, 
all these institutions you are scoring are pretty much 20th century institutions. Um, they're not. Uh, they're not online and they're not offshore, they're, they're, they're still intergovernmental institutions. And um, far be it for me to advocate a, a world tax authority because it would never come into being, the Congress would never vote for it. But we need to be looking a, a little bit more virtually at, at, at the issue, especially of, of tax, as John has just said, because it's it escaping the, the grasp of uh, governments. Um, and one last uh, point. Um, Joe's point about parliaments being governments, I mean, we often get MPs turning up at our meetings, there may not be any in the audience today, but if, if any MP here was from the Labour Party, he'd say, well, I'm with the opposition, I'm not government, parliament is broader than that, please. Thank you. Adrian, you, you know a suspiciously large amount about the global casino economy. <laughs> <laughs> which we'll have to yes, what stake yeah. do you have? <laughs> <coughs> yes, Matthew Martin, DFI, I'm one of the co-authors of the report. I just wanted to give people a, a bit of a flavour of not so much how it was done, but how difficult it was to mm. do. Because I think one of the first things we did was a trawl of how can we assess the impact of these organisations. And we found that there is astonishingly little assessment by the organisations themselves or even by independent analysts of what impact they're having. And that's really surprising at a point when everybody is so obsessive, for example, in the aid debate about what results we're producing and trying to measure them. Uh, and yet we do either spend quite a lot of money on whether it's summit meetings or whatever it may be for these organisations or g disperse quite a lot of money through them. And there is really very little assessment of their impact going on. And th there are some very, there's some very good work being done by some of the independent evaluation officers in these organisations. But when you try to say what are they contributing to the global development framework or global development progress, it is really, really difficult to do. So, you know, we're going to have a workshop after this to try and with some technical people sort of attack that and try to work out more and then discuss with the institutions themselves more in Washington in a few weeks what their plans are to, to increase this. But it's really, really difficult. I think um, on the civil society issue, I think it's really important to say, and maybe it's not phrased right in the report, the, I, don't, I, I would entirely agree that it's not about CSOs taking decisions, but it is about stakeholders globally take, helping to take decisions. So whether you mean by that labor unions, whether you mean by that the private sector, whether you mean they are all members of the community, they all deserve a voice in the, in the decision-making process, particularly if they're things like labor laws which are going to affect them and so on. So I think w we were trying to make a case for a broader involvement of them. Not that they take the final decision, because clearly but governments I'm will sorry, always... But isn't what you say. They are listed along with governments and citizens as equal on page six, line four. Yeah, no, well, I just said maybe and it's and not expressed that's correctly that's in the report. I but I think it. it's very important that we, we, we realize that that's what we were trying to talk about in the broader issue. Yeah. Um, and then I think one of, one of the other things that really we struggled with, and I, I hope we did a reasonable job, but we would very much like feedback if we didn't, is um, that there are, there's a really big issue of translating jargon, notably on the FSB side, mm -hmm. where you know financial regulation is sometimes seen as this black box that nobody even wants to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I just want to stress to people in the room and, and more broadly, how vital, as, as most of the people on the panel have said, these issues are to development. And sometimes they seem incredibly arcane, just as you know the Paris Club and debt and whatever seemed arcane 20 years ago. But so I think one of the things this report tries to achieve, and if it doesn't, please tell us, is actually translating these ridiculous concepts and arcane debates that go on in these organizations into something that can try to link it to, to the global development priorities. If it doesn't do that, we want to really make it do that better in future. And we want, we will be, I think, in future editions of the report also coming out with some ideas for some very clear recommendations for what are the most important actions that these organizations could take to improve governance and impact. So really just to welcome all the comments that have been made so far and encourage more. Thanks, Matthew. There's one uh, right over here. Thank you, uh, James Mackey from ECDPM. And my comment actually follows on quite ne neatly from Matthew's um, I've, uh, I'm particularly interested in the point that Cyrus and Dirk Willem brought up about the post-2015 and the financing of that. And wouldn't, I mean, the question really is, wouldn't it be uh, easier perhaps to demonstrate um, the value of a report like this if you focused on an issue like that, financing for the post-2015, and look at how, how you could measure impact of these institutions and the, the role they play in that, you know, given that 
the MDG-8 was, a, was difficult to monitor, was, uh, was impossible to monitor, really, um, and that there's been a lot of dissatisfaction about that, and that needs to change in the future. Couldn't you focus the report more on that, not only on that, but more on that? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say one, 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 one right here, and then we'll, we'll uh, go back to the panel. Yeah, my name is Fleming Ball. I'm uh, from Slamco. I've been trying to mirror the reports on the basis of um, the Financial Reporting Standard Board in England and the International Financial Regulatory System that is internationally more or less regulating financial reporting. Because the reason why we always agree that majority of the money coming or going to investment is coming from the private sector. Right, and um, if majority of the, I mean, money coming from investment going to this um, country, coming from the private sector, I wonder what influence have they got in the way you write your report? Because if I could mirror a report to the Financial Reporting Standard Board or regulatory system, I could begin to understand the measurement, the weakness of the measurement on your, I mean, report. Right, so I do think that, I mean, yeah, I mean, the measurement on your report, because you said overall governance, right, of um, financial, I mean, sorry, financial governance, right, and in that respect, I wonder to what extent you actually take into consideration this institution, which are, are really, really influencing financial reports all over the world, how much influence you do take from them to write your report? So just um, to understand, uh, the point you're making is that there's not sufficient attention on the, pri on the private sector. Well, I, th it I think it is exclusively right from government's financial system, I see. which I think, in I mean, natural fact, you're saying that financial de sorry development is more or less coming from like this inter I mean international intergovernment institution rather than I mean the, the parts played by the private sector okay. or the, the commercial bodies. Okay. Thank you. So le le let's go, um, Jo Marie. If you want to pick up any, any of any of those points, and then I'll turn yeah. to Deborah yeah. and then Cyrus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, these are extremely useful and important questions. Um, I don't promise you are all going to be satisfied, or that any of you will be satisfied with what we produce going forward. But um, I mean, for example, the um, the reference to the the words that you pointed out, Sheila, you're absolutely correct. We've equated civil society and governance. Trying to get at an idea and we, you know, we're focused over here and something slid in that didn't make sense. And those are the kinds of things, if you would like to point out to us systematically, if you would like to do that kind of, of review, we would welcome it. Um, I have cards here and I'd be happy to get emails with those kinds of edits. <laughs> because I reread it last week very closely, and I'm going, oh my God, did we really say that? You know, there's a line missing here. We, we've all been there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. I said this is like reading my dissertation before there were computers. It's very painful. Um, okay. Um, I did want to, let me see. On the uh, who said, if you're not in the room, you if you're not in the room, Actually, I was quoting a Jesuit priest, no and right. I heard him in 1988. Um, and how do you think about power and government? Mm -hmm. Who wins, who loses, who decides? And I would say that you may not be in the room if you're a billionaire contributing mm -hmm. your billions. Um, your voice is very loud by the size of your contribution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so you are clearly in the room virtually. Um, whether electronically or physically or whatever. I don't do well with electronic and virtual. I'm sorry, I have to leave it to the 20-year-olds. Um, I just can't do it, I'm but, sorry. But actually Adrian's point is a slightly different one, isn't it? it, it it's, it's essentially that you've got you know, groups of actors mm -hmm. who are operating in a sort of virtual world with, with respect to their influence over the institutions mm -hmm. that, that you're measuring. Mm -hmm. True. And, and you True. might... Y and I guess it's a point for the future iterations mm -hmm. that, you know, might it be possible to look at the sort of organisational structures mm -hmm. through which, you know, they seek to bring influence to bear in, in the areas that, that you cover? Yeah, that's a whole other... <laughs> that's more in the decision-making processes rather than in the 
structural arrangements and mm -hmm. in the outputs and the outcomes. You need a, a virtual structure. Yeah. Well, well an example would be in taxation that, that Sheila raises, mm -hmm. that you know, if you look at mm -hmm. what really yeah. informs government thinking on tax policy, That's you know, true. it's basically small clusters of accounting firms who, you know, right, working right, for large right, corporations right, right. who are often on government committees, actually. Right. But, but, you know, it would be an interesting angle. I mean, it, it may be overload as well, but it might, you know, it might be worth... We're also recru recruiting authors, so you, you want to write that <laughs> chapter for us. Hey, <laughs> we will expand our page limit to adapt. Um, but there's also a challenge, of, for example, on the financial transaction tax. There's a challenge of, you know, they will avoid it because they have all these computers. But then why don't governments also use their computers? Um, there's a, there's the so issue is why don't governments respond in equal speed complexity, dynamism. It's called how much money are we willing to pay in taxes and to have that money allocated. In the United States, we keep cutting the IRS budget. Uh, it's the biggest, the most productive source of income for the U.S. federal budget is to increase IRS staff and, and compliance officers is one of the, it's the simplest and cheapest way to, to increase revenue. But instead, the government cuts the budgets for the IRS, they also cut it in their training, so you have untrained IRS officials. I mean, this is why governments don't compete at the same level. Are we going to look at who are the external forces that really set the rules for governments? That's, that's an interesting angle, and we should think about it. I don't know whether we'll be able to do it or not. Um, if we had a very large grant, we would do wonders. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, maybe Adrian could speak to his friend, who... <laughs> 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 um, I wouldn't gamble on that. <laughs> so let, let me just... Um, Sorry, there was one point was made on the linking of the post-2015 sure. debate, which you sort of touched on a little bit, but I don't, maybe you, you sure. want to take that. Sure. Well, um, thanks. I, I think that the, the issue of linking uh, the institutional governance elements together in the service of sustainable development is the key challenge mm -hmm. and uh, because they are all in silos and uh, Matthew one of the reasons uh, why the jargon is there uh, is because you can then very much bury yourself in a silo and mm -hmm. say you don't really understand the world of trade for example if you're in the IMF mm -hmm. uh, or understand the world of finance if you're in the WTO and that's very convenient, and it's a fantastic expedient for getting out of anything. And mm -hmm. so having this type of report mm -hmm. really starts biting a little bit if it rallies around a particular theme. Mm -hmm. So what, what could be some of the themes for the future? And this, is, mm -hmm. this also serves another yeah. purpose, which is to sort of a send a signal, <laughs> a warning <coughs> signal. You know, when we have the next report, we're going to be looking at A, B, and C as well as doing the assessment. So what would that be? At this time, with the post-2015 framework coming, it would be about uh, how did the, uh, the institutions that are relevant to financial and, I, for me, sustainable development governance, the cluster of them, uh, deal with the uh, financing aspects of development. Because in the MDG, remember the sequence in the MDGs. We had the MDGs, then we had the Monterey Conference. So everyone thought of what the goals should be, and then they scratched their heads and said, but we forgot about where the money's going to come from. <laughs> You see, now if that's forgotten again, these institutions that say that they're going to be helping support member countries to mm -hmm. deliver the, the, eff uh, the effort or to help member countries deliver their effort to reach these global goals, uh, will run back and say, but we don't have the money. So having something in the next report which says, what, how, how have you joined all this up in the context of the Global Partnership for Development, MDG 8, Global Partnership for Development, where did the money come from? That would be something the report should be looking at and saying, well, while we look at the silos, what we did we see about how you joined yourselves up? And there are other linkages or there are other areas of discrete focus in a report, chapters or whatever it might be, addressing shocks. I think is it would be really important in digging into the failures of governance and, and actually helping the institutions climb back out of that. Um, 
the trade issue I mentioned particularly. And then there's one other thing that came from the floor, which I, I thought was a very good idea, um, is the look at um, their own self-evaluations. So you may recall that the, I think this was G8 uh, did at the Canadian Muskoka summit or something, they did an evaluation of their own commitments. And they actually found themselves quite short on what they'd promised in development. Uh, the G20 looked at its accountability on its development work after how many years it's been, three or four years, with their accountability report last year. But they were very clever. They said, we're going to do the next one in three years from now. So they can kind of forget about it for three years and come back to it. <laughs> um, the IMF and World Bank have evaluation officers, but some comment on the quality of their own self-evaluation itself is telling you something about governance. I was part of the IEO panel, the, the evaluation of the IEO panel. Two things came out that I remember in this discussion. One was the IEO, Independent Evaluation Office of the IMF, did a report on governance. They did their own report on governance in the IMF. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the board absolutely hated it because, you know, this was now, you know, really interrogating very closely mm -hmm. governance issues. So it tells you something about it. It also did a report on trade and the, the, the role of the IMF in trade. Most of those that interrogated the report said, we don't really understand this or its value. Yeah. But of course, it's so directly linked. So looking at the evaluations themselves, mm -hmm. of the institution's own governance evaluations would be a good idea. So we could have um, <coughs> a chat on who evaluates <coughs> the evaluators. Yeah. One very important thing on the independent evaluation office in the IMF, and we're go going to be talking to the IEG staff after spring meetings. The independent evaluation office um, is set up to report to the executive directors. The executive directors have very high turnover. They don't even know what the IEO is. They don't know that it's answerable to the executive directors, not management. Every three years, management reports on those re IEO recommendations that were board approved. And every time, they say all of the recommendations are implemented mm -hmm. on time and in full, except for these which are in midstream, and they will be very quickly finished properly. So the actual, I mean, it's not the evaluation, it's the implementation, and it's that management runs away with itself and just gets away with it because the board doesn't understand its own power. And how do you teach that? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, we, um, I mean we, we hosted a round table here a couple of weeks ago on the impact of the IMF. And, uh, but it was actually done by the IMF themselves. Um, and uh, well there were a number of, of conclusions, I think, from that, from that round table. But one was um, that it's difficult to do. So, um, whenever there's an intervention from the IMF, it could be a policy-oriented one or a finance one oriented, but it's very often in combination with other uh, things that are happening. So other aid agencies might might um, depend on the IMF, and uh, uh, so, so, so it's very difficult to think about what's the counterfactual, so what impact is very difficult to think about. We, we, we thought about that it ch has changed over time, so that's why it's important to think about uh, doing this over time, because back in the 80s, nobody was really thinking that the IMF were doing a good job at that stage. Uh, now, uh, they're much more flexible and uh, so sort of think that the institutions can, uh, can change over time. But also an important uh, uh, suggestion was made actually afterwards was to say, well, why is it the IMF doing this? Uh, and it should be uh, institutions uh, like, like John Marie's one and others, independent organizations, uh, do doing these, these, uh, these uh, evaluations. Um, and I, I just want to echo your, your Cyrus's point on finance, because I think this is about financial governance. So we've got to be thinking that at least one transmission mechanism through which uh, these institutions have an impact on developing countries is finance. And it is about the volume of finance, it's about the volatility of finance, it's about mm -hmm. the quality of finance. And, uh, and so thinking, thinking that through would, will be important. And that's absolutely central to the finance for development discussions mm -hmm. uh, that uh, James Mackey was, uh, uh, was referring to. And then also finally that point that, uh, that Sheila was making and others is about the difference between evaluating institutions mm -hmm. and rules um, mm -hmm. and body coordinating bodies. Mm -hmm. So these are three different things actually. So you can, the institutions, mm -hmm. you, can, you can think it through. Then you, uh, so physical institutions as it were, mm -hmm. and having a program. 
you don't have rules and, and, and how do you in, in assess the impact of a WHO rule uh, or, or, or a banking rule, the Basel rule, for instance, and there are Stephanie's here, but there are lots of others who, uh, not, not sorry, not many <laughs> others who have done, uh, have done work on it, but also the co coordinating bodies. And I think that is, that's why I think, the, the, so I'm always thinking of the G20 in that sense, is that what would have happened if the G G20 wasn't there? So you have those discussions about QE tapering, yeah. about uh, currencies in the, in, in the past. If it hadn't been there, would it have got turned nasty? Would it, the t discussion have turned nasty? At least you have, a, you have a coordinating body that, that, that can sort of channel the anger that different countries have towards each other. They can kind of send press releases into different, uh, different uh, newspapers and so on, and, and they can have discussions. But it's, it gives you a structure uh, to talk and to, to, to be informed about issues. So at least you have something. But e assessing the impact of that can be quite, <laughs> can be quite hard. But, um, but that's maybe what we talk about later. Thanks. I'm going to push our luck side, because I know we're running over a little bit. But oh, I'm going to take. Um, Three more really short questions, um, and then invite Joe Marie to make a make a comment at the, right right at the end. So uh, we'll start over here. Hello, uh, my name is Sandra Madden. Really uh, quick question: um, the very key goal of this report, I understand, is to really to test and and, and, and find an answer if if these organisations fit propose. And with propose, I understand you mean you know positive impact on people's lives. Uh, do you look, I haven't seen, of course, the full report, but do you look in the report, actually, uh, do these organizations actually see this as they propose? Mm -hmm. If they do, how they define it? What is actually the, the reference point? And I think there may be also interesting outcomes on how they define what is good for people, if at all. That's their mandate. I, Thank I you. think the report does that to some degree, actually, mm -hmm. but, but it would certainly look, look at it. Mm -hmm. There was one, sorry, there was one sorry. question here. You've already had a go, oh, unless... Yeah. So, um, it's uh, I'm Celine Tan from uh, the Warwick Law School at University of Warwick. Um, this is just sort of like my sort of lawyer hat on and going to the sort of discussions about rules and coordinating bodies and mm -hmm. with Sheila and Dirk mentioned. Um, it's sort of my, when I, when I sort of teach undergraduates and sort of postgraduates in international um, economic law, I kind of make that distinction between hard law and soft law. And I think one of the issues that come up in terms of global financial governance is that it's distinctiveness from other areas of international mm -hmm. economic governance in the sense that while you have international trade law and international investment law moving towards greater harmonization, codification, etc., you've got sort of, you know, this sort of limbo, um, and actually it's the reverse, Since certainly since the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, you've got a very sort of, you know, soft approach to international financial governance and the justification of that has been that it's more flexible, that it responds, you know, it, it's much more responsive that way. You don't get caught up into, you know, these sort of international legal uh, instruments that take forever to, to treaties that take forever to amend, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one of the things my suggestion would be to kind of work it into the next um, uh, report, that sort of the, the, the the difference, in a sense, between these sort of hard institutions and the hard the the Bretton Woods system, the old Bretton Woods system, and then currently the IMF, etc., and the new sort of transgovernmental networks, which is the FSB, the G20, etc., which is sort of dependent on, you know, it's the the, the, the distinction between the binding and non-binding nature. Um, I've just got one comment on CSOs. In a sense, have to keep it really sorry, short, yeah, I'm very afraid. short. In a sense that, um, that in many developing countries where the parliamentary system isn't as established as it is in democratic uh, uh, societies, CSOs actually function I as a sort of de facto opposition. So I think that needs to be borne in, in, in mind when we're talking about representatives. Thank you. And there's one question right at the back here, then that's the last one. Thank you, Sargon Nissen from the uh, Bretton Woods Project, which is a watchdog of the IMF and World Bank. So a couple comments. I think one of the things that we could uh, try and do in the next iteration of this is to make a clearer and finer distinction between de jure and de facto rules. Because I think we've touched upon this indirectly uh, in various comments and so from the chair and from um, the audience. I think y there are really interesting ideas. I think a book by Randall Stone called Controlling Institutions a couple of years back talked about these institutions, some of the institutions featured in the report, talking about informal versus formal governance and how much of the actual rule making and implementation has nothing to do with what's written down on paper. Um, I think also Celine's reminded me, you know, there's human rights laws internationally um, which are flouted with impunity and there are things like Basel recommendations which are adopted as if they were concrete rules within a year or two. 
So I think that explains that. Regarding the I.O. and LICS in particular, I was a respondent in the uh, ODI mm -hmm. event just a few weeks ago. Right. And, um, you know, I, sp I spoke to the uh, I.E.O., the Independent Evaluation Office, myself, and it tells you a little bit about the role civil society plays. I absolutely went ballistic with them in their current um, guys, uh, in their current report about IMF uh, response to the crisis and the fact that they're having to exclude licks from it. They're not immune uh, to pressure, political pressure from EDs, threats to their budget, and so on. The idea of independent evaluation office is one that is actually really difficult. And I threatened to kick up a fuss, and I don't know how much they were happy for me to do so, to be able to then promise to do a report on licks. So you see, there is a lot of informal relationships yeah. and informal pressures that have to be understood, and which we could, I think, in this report, begin to bring out. So I think, you know, the idea of rules being a photocopy democracy is, is really a risk. Thank you. Thank you, that, that's great. Jeremy, I'm going to give you um, a, a couple of minutes to just a few, few final reflections. You, you don't have to respond to the specifics, but just a, a couple of general thoughts on the day. I mean, one, one thought I have, I, I, I think this is an fan, absolutely fantastic report and, and makes a, a really valuable contribution. The, the, the one issue I would raise for discussion for next year's one is on the metric, actually. Because the thing is, if, like in a way, you're, you want to use this to incentivize behavioral change in the, in the institutions. And the trouble is that when you have very broad bands mm -hmm. and everyone scores roughly the same, it, you know, it, it loses that incentive mm -hmm. effect. You know, if everyone gets two and yeah. you have to work really hard to... And, and, and there are different ways that you could approach it. That, you know, one, you know, you could just stretch it out a little bit. <coughs> The, the other would be that you, you, you do a sort of human in development index type mm -hmm. approach where <laughs> you take the best institution yeah. and you say that this is 100. Yeah. So in how do you yeah. score against this, uh, this, be this best institution? Like the global burden of disease discussion yesterday, which I know yeah. you don't agree with, but... The best isn't very good, is it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> No, but I mean, if you took a different institution, maybe the, you know, that wasn't one of these institutions. How about the Vatican? Well, <laughs> okay, I've tried to make. Three, I've, three. I've, I've tried to make a serious contribution. I love it. Jim Reed. I like it a lot. Okay, again, thank you very much. It's it's been a very productive conversation. We have a lot to learn. Um, I do invite you to take my card if you want to send comments, edits suggestions, volunteer to write segments. Oh, yeah. Uh, we love that. Um, I do want to have just one observation on why we treat the FSB and the G20 so importantly. Um, and it occurs to me that it's comparable to, now this is a stretch, but use your imagination, play along. It's similar to excluding women from men's golf courses. Why shouldn't the boys play golf by themselves? Because business decisions and political linkages are made on the golf course. And if you are excluded from those elite clubs, you are excluded from playing hardball politics and business. And that's why we want to look at the exclusive club of the Atlanta golf course called the G20. <laughs> who's welcome, who chose the membership, who doesn't get in, Norway, Sweden, Finnmark, Denmark, don't qualify. Who does qualify? Indonesia, Argentina? You know, nothing, it doesn't make sense. So these are, you know, there are rules, there are, there are rules, de facto rule-making bodies. And so it's formal and informal. Um, and I would just want to say thank you a million for challenging us, uh, challenging us down to our socks. And I think it's been great. I don't prom make any promises. Thank you. Well, look, I just, I, I, I think for all of us, just say you thank you, Jim Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. And anyone who wants to place an online bet um, <laughs> <laughs> on Macau, uh, uh, you see it's the Adrian for very favourable terms. He's a cyberspace guru. <laughs> Great.